All right. So thank you very much for joining us. My name is John Min. I'm a co-host with uh, Pat Goldsmith. I'm from Magma Gymnastics in Region 7. Pat is from Niagara Gymnastics up north of me in good old New York. So once again, I wish to thank everyone for joining us. We have a wonderful panel discussion today. Uh, some really illustrious people, people who've been involved in our sport for a long time. As you can see from the promotion here, we have uh, Dr. Gerald George, who wrote the Championship Gymnastics. If you don't own that book, you need to get it. You need to get it, seriously. It, it is one of the, my highlights in my mantelpiece of uh, technical books on gymnastics. In addition to that, he is a professor emeritus at Louisiana State University. Uh, then we have Dr. Dave Tilly, as you all know from SHIFT. He, he's a wonderful resource, a DVT, SES, CSCS. Uh, basically a wealth of information. He'll be joining us as well. Uh, we also have uh, Cheryl uh, Hoffman from uh, Masters of Sports. As everyone may, may or not know, Cheryl is a member of the USACA board, and she has been a, a longtime uh, coach and clinician of the sport of gymnastics. And then last but not least, we have our own USACA chairman, <laughs> uh, Tony Retrosi from Gym Momentum. Also, he runs the Atlantic Gymnastic Training Center up in New Hampshire. Tony has uh, been involved in USAG for longer than I've been involved, so you know, and I've been involved a long time. So once again, I, I wish to welcome all four of these wonderful guests. And today's topic on couch, Coaches on Couches 3 is the brains of gymnastics, or basically the biomechanics and the building of the gymnast body. So we're gonna go into kind of the aspects of the physicality, the science, the training of making a strong, healthy, long-lasting athlete. Uh, once again, I just want to show the card of who our esteemed panelists are. Dr. Gerald George, Dr. Dave Tilly, Sherry Hoffman, Tony Retrosi. Uh, online protocols, if you haven't already done so, please make sure that your video is off, that your camera is on a mute, only the host and panelists will speak. Uh, if you do have any questions, please use the chat and, and write specifically to Pat Goldsmith uh, your questions if you have any during the live panel. We also have some questions that were previously received through email. Uh, all the, the episode will be recorded, just to let you know, and then they will be posted on YouTube at a later date. Uh, and just really quick, next week we will have a clinic on power, developing and maintaining for vault and tumbling with Dan Baker from Stars Gymnastics, Tony Gaiman, Bill Roth, and Charlton Kraus, and that will be next week. So, thank you so much for joining us, and let's start the panel. All right, wonderful, wonderful. <coughs> <clears throat> so obviously, the biggest question we're gonna have is how to get the athletes back into form and into shape from the long time that we've had off from the coronavirus and the shutdown. Some gyms have been shut down, uh, entering their eighth week, seventh week, which is a very long period of time. So because of that, we want to actually look into the science of the gymnast body, how we develop it, how we train it, and how we prolong it. So I'm gonna basically uh, start with Dr. George, you know, our premier guest. And I wanna ask you, Dr. George, when a gymnast is off for this along a period of time, do you feel that it's such a long period that the athlete will have to, in some ways, take longer to recover and maintain their skills? Or is it not as insurmountable as most people are worried about? You have the floor. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I, I believe that it's uh, not quite as insurmountable as one might seem. And the reason being is that uh, properly followed programs on times off, if you would, can actually be very beneficial, if not more beneficial than actual training. Sometimes it's good to take a break, if you would, from the constant specific pounding that gymnasts uh, sustain by virtue of doing the same kinds of, of routines and things day in and day out, that pounding, that intensity, sometimes it's better to broad base it and look at broad movement patterns, number one, and then look at emphasizing specific unique weaknesses of each gymnast in terms of uh, gross training. For example, if a gymnast happens to be weak 
proportionately in her body, let's say in the frontal muscles of her body, it might be good to design a specific exercise program for that gymnast or that, that, in addition to uh, gross motor movements that they would normally do. I don't believe the time off that way would hurt them at all. In fact, I think it would actually be beneficial. Thank you very much. Uh, Dave, I'd love to hear from you next, and then we can go to Tony. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with what Dr. George said. I think that um, people are really, um, we've never had a time period where this amount of time has been taken off, you know, from a, a, an involuntary, you know, unfortunately injuries or family decisions or personal choices take people out for a long time. But we've never seen a situation where somebody has this kind of amount of time, they're going to be out of the gym completely, unless it's for a different reason. So I, I completely agree that it's not as insurmountable as people think. I do think that we really have to reframe how we think about how we're going to go back to the gym. And there's a lot of really good uh, data in the workload science, which has emerged in the last 10 years to show this from Tim Gabbett and many other good researchers is that if you do have a, a trough in workload, you have a sudden spike in workload too rapidly that the, the risk of injury, not the rate, but the risk of injury is, is pretty, pretty large for the following weeks that come after the training, especially with overuse injuries. So I think that people need to really um, have a, a completely different mindset in terms of how slow to go when they come back, what the primary focus of their time is going to be, um, and, the, and kind of the long tail impact it's going to have over the next three months. So that'd be the first thing uh, on more of a nitty gritty point of view. I think that um, a lot of the work that's going to have to be done in the kind of the limiting chain factor is going to be the, the joints themselves, and then also the smaller tendon junctions and things like that. You know, people are going to be mentally in fifth gear to want to do gymnastics again, but in first gear, the tissue that hasn't been loaded like that for a long time is going to be really vulnerable. So I think younger athletes that we already know have growth plate issues, uh, a lot of even older athletes are going to have a lot of work to be done, like uh, Dr. George said, in global movement patterns and just general strength and conditioning, and not only gymnastics-specific strength and conditioning, they have to do both to recondition their body to handle uh, you know, force transfer and buffering of forces, kind of maybe the peak shape they were in before is not going to be there. Tony. Um. I was joking with Sherry earlier that I'm kind of like the dummy on the board and that everybody <laughs> else is very no. science based and I have a degree in history and psychology with a minor in philosophy. Um, but working with, uh, working with the girls both in Italy as well as in my gym, I just kind of look at this time as bringing anybody back from an injury. And my experience has showed me that it normally takes about 50% more time when they come back than the time that they missed. So if they missed eight weeks, it's going to take me 12 weeks to get them back to where they were. Certainly, this is not scientifically based. This is just my, this is just my experience. I look at seeing how hungry the girls are and feeling that I'm going to spend more time slowing them down and saying, hey, I know you want to do this, but let's start on our softer landings. Let's spend a little bit more time on trampoline. Let's spend a little bit more time on the tumble track, on the power track. Let's really get back to you know, fixing those problem parts that Dr. George had mentioned earlier. I had a gymnast that I was just emailing with earlier who she's 18 years old. Old. She probably hasn't been able to do a uh, stalled or press handstand since in, in four or five years, just as she has grown and her body shape has changed. But she was all excited because she's had very little else to work on. And so I think if the girls are using their time even relatively wisely, that they're actively resting, they're keeping their, their mind back in the sport when the girls come back in the gym as coaches we have to take the reins and realize we, we have to walk this is coming back from an injury and it's going to take us if we've been out eight weeks look at 12 weeks look at 16 weeks before you actually expect to get back to where you were if you make it in 15 weeks that's great but if you rush it you, you really just blew your opportunity. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Sherry, did you want to say anything about this topic? Yeah, I think that um, if we look at the peripheral parts of the 
gymnasts like their hands you know they're they would have been without bars for quite a while so you know is their grip strength going to be compromised is there are their forearms going to be a little weaker you know they can't swing the 10 giants in a row maybe right off so kind of watching the I don't know the peripheral parts and the ankles and to me bringing these athletes back I would have to do a little bit of writing myself um, in documentation a verification of if these kids were weak in an area when when they left they're going to be just as weak or worse when they come back so I need to remember that when we're coaching and not give them all the same thing to do you know and you guys have all alluded to you know the the conditioning and the strength so we just have to make it personal for each athlete those are very good points um i'm going to go back to uh dr george real quickly if we had to now obviously we want the athletes to kind of like condition at home but if we had to focus more on one area than the other would you have your athletes at home focus more on their flexibility more on their actual uh strength you know especially to weight ratio or more on like speed drills and dexterity type drills? Do you have a preference if we had to like focus on an order or an amount? Okay, I'm gonna unmute oh, you, uh, you're all yours. Sorry, um, it's not that I have a preference. Uh, gymnastics by its very nature is, is inherently muscular endurance oriented. That is the prime factor while while flexibility is important, strength is important, power is important, reaction time, speed of movement, all of these things, you can go on ad nauseum, different areas. Muscular endurance is the key component. I would design, first of all, as the base for all their, their uh, if you want to call it off-season training, uh, muscular endurance type activities, uh, broad-based activities where they're doing more uh gross movement type patterns okay i would do that to keep them in general shape good shape for muscular endurance okay that would be the key thing the second thing would be specificity training specific to the weaknesses of each given performer i mm -hmm. i wouldn't be so concerned with a performer that ha has a weakness let's say and you're worried about how much weaker she'll be when she gets back i would look at it this way if she has a weakness then you want it to be stronger when she gets back okay so what i i would say just like i said in my book and i'm not trying to push the book at all believe me but you take your weakest event and make it your best well in in training you do the same thing Aristotle once said, said it correctly, it's in the balance, you see. It's not who's the strongest or who's the most flexible. It's who has a balance of flexibility, strength, muscular endurance, that type of thing. So it's in the balance of training that's more important. So I know that's broad based, but that's, that's my response to you. Thank you. Uh, Dave, do you mind giving us some input? For sure, I, I couldn't agree more. Again, it's, it's fantastic. Um, I think there's two really important things to think about here. So one is one of the biggest limiters we're gonna have to a lot of the athletes coming back, like Dr. George alluded to, is gonna be their ability to just maintain their endurance and work for a long period of time. I mean, a lot of these kids are previously training three, four hours, sometimes two a days, and now they've dropped off and how much they can do. I think gymnastics is muscular endurance, but it also has a lot of repeat sprintability in a, in a whole body point of view. And so obviously it's not like a soccer match, but they have to take turns. They take turns over and over and that's kind of repeat sprintability. And so that ability to do work for a long period of time with high quality and safely is kind of where the safety point comes into view. So I think at home, you know, there's, and we can dig into some other science, the workload science of this, but if we can maintain a little bit of their workload, a fraction of it, 20, 30%, it makes a massive difference when they come back to, to being able to smooth that gap. Um, and I think that it's really important that we try to incorporate, I think circuits are really good to do when you get back, but also now, cause you can get a lot, a lot of broad movements done in a really short period of time in 20 minutes. And it's easy to do in the gym, big spaced out areas. So if you can kind of think about that, I think that's how people are probably going to find the most success with it. And kind of on that uh, thought process is we, 
you know, didn't really know for a while whether we were going to have a season or not, whether the competition season would come back. So people are like, do we keep them in peaking mode? Do we do more power stuff? Do we go back? You know, what are we doing here? But clearly we can see there's no competition season. So we need to kind of reframe. We're going to enter back into a general preparation mode, a skills mode, a base mode, you know, and we're not entering back into a routine mode. So we need to really think about, okay, using this time we have now, you should be planning you know, when I go back, what strength can I do? How can we stay socially distanced and do it safely? Like, what can we do to get them back into that general base mode because of the time off, but also because it's a, it's a long, elongated summer or off season. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. So Tony, real quickly, if I may ask, uh, when you're dealing with your athletes, uh, do, you, do you find sometimes, uh, do you focus on when you're doing flexibility, you just focus on flexibility. When you're doing like speed, you focus on speed or do you, do you tend to like to cross train or, and do more of a broad spectrum as well? Well, I think gymnastics by itself is, is cross training. I never focus on one thing. I, I, let's just take floor exercise, for example. I can't just say today we're back tumbling because you're going to have to back tumble and front tumble. So for me, there's always an element of every little part it's like uh it's like going to the buffet and you need to take a little bit from each part <laughs> and, and that's kind of how that's kind of how i build their training is i have a little bit of, of each part into it my concern when i get back into the gym is what have the girls been doing since we've been gone have they been spending more time just trying to keep their endurance up and doing long distance running, which is definitely going to have an effect on their power because it, it, it's really working something completely different. Or do I have somebody that because we had snow this week that they've really only worked a lot of flexibility and haven't worked a lot of strength. So I have to kind of get back to that. But my whole program is real about, really about stepping up to that buffet and getting each and every little, get a little bite from each piece. And before I turn it over to Sherry, I wanted to remember to say happy birthday to uh, Dr. George. It was his birthday, yesterday. I believe it was yesterday. Happy birthday, sir. <laughs> happy birthday. Sherry, do you mind following up on that? Yeah, I think um, what, what Tony and um, Dave and George are saying are, are all great points when it comes to bringing these athletes in but it's um i think we need to have a, a discussion with them so they truly understand what's going to happen you know with some of these young brains i'm not sure they're going to come in and feel that you know whatever it is they've been doing is going to be enough to pull them back in to where they left so they left the gym in a certain shape and they're coming back thinking that because they kept active with their little Zoom things and whatever, like where are they really? So kind of keeping the break on them is gonna be pretty important mentally and physically. Tony, did you have your hand up? I, I do. Oh, yes. um, I, I, I look and I think we have to remember how resilient the kids are. Their body, their whole body is made to be a about exploring and trying all these things. So I, I, I am pretty optimistic that with, with a, a decent plan, they're going to be able to overcome a lot of this. And I think two weeks back in the gym, they're going to forget about this time where they're locked in their home. And I, I think they'll, you know, just knowing what my conversations are with the, with the athletes. And I, I'm in a unique situation where I'm talking with athletes from Iceland and Italy as, and down in Latin America, as well as American athletes in my own gym. And they all are bringing about the same problems and the same questions. And it just makes me realize that our similarities are, are bigger than our differences. And I think that when they come back, they're going to just, there, there's a lot of muscle memory that they're going to get back to. And I think that's just where we need to kind of put the brakes on and go, yeah, I know your body remembers how to do a double back, <laughs> but let's, let's kind of walk into this today. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. All right, so I'm going to go into a bit of a, a controversial topic and see what our panelists think. Uh, flexibility. Uh, basically, when I was coaching, when I was a younger coach, uh, we were actually told to be very aggressive and personally hands-on stretching the girls. Uh, one gym I was at, each of the optional girls had to find a coach and had to get down split and straddle split and we'd have to apply pressure and all that stuff. And it was a lot of excessive partnering, spotting and, and, and stretching. Now, obviously with a safe sport and other, you know, things in the media and stuff, we're not really supposed to be as aggressively hands-on enforcing the stretch to get that flexibility. So what is your opinion on that concept of flexibility and how do you find alternative methods to increase an athlete's flexibility? Dr. George, if you don't mind going first, I'll unmute you. Okay, no, thank you. Um, uh, flexibility uh, has many components and uh, the idea of having uh, someone move you through ranges of motion uh, essentially is fine, notwithstanding the problems with safe sport that, that area. But having someone do that is fine, provided they understand and interact with you in a judicious way to know uh, how much to assist you in this, what I call in my textbook, passive flexibility. Uh, passive flexibility is only the beginning component uh, because ultimately you have to have active flexibility and more importantly active dynamic flexibility which means that you're going to be using the muscles most involved to, for that range of motion to go through that range of motion and specificity dictates that the best training uh, more often than not, is that training which most closely approximates the actual situation, the gymnastic situation. Consequently, dynamic, uh, active flexibility training, that's where the gymnast uses her own muscles to achieve ranges of motion, uh, are very important, most important. Now, obviously, at the beginning, you can have passive where you are, you either stretch yourself passively and or utilize assistance to stretch yourself. But that's only the first component. Is it necessary? I believe it is. I believe it's good to do. It's good to achieve. And in fact, if you if you carry it if if you carry it on it looks like he's using his phone to zoom. So uh, <laughs> oh there he is. Oh. Sorry. Uh yeah. Uh you, you, want, you want to have active dynamic flexibility training as the major thing ultimately. But passive training is just like gaining flexibility as a, uh, 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 subsequent to an injury. A trainer would do the same thing. They would, they would passively uh, stretch uh, the, the joint area through a given range of motion and once whatever uh, uh, range is achieved, the next phase is to see if you can actively do it yourself uh, with your own muscles and then ultimately you like for gymnastics the rate at which you can go through that range of motion okay because rate training and active flexibility training are essentially no different they're both one and the same so is it okay i think it is is it important i think it's uniquely important uh for Certain people in certain instances, if they have specific weaknesses that need to be emphasized. So one, one key area that's often missed is the uh, thoracic vertebrae and hyperextension. Okay, that's the kyphosis, the, I don't want to use one of those academic terms, one, you know, the bending of the vertebrae in the thorax uh, is often overlooked, particularly in hyperextension. Uh, it's good to have passive uh, training for that to get a person to utilize their entire vertebral column when doing skills. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry very much. Dave, I'd like to awesome. ask you to follow up on that question. And but I'd also like to ask specifically, what is your feeling also on over splitting and also the length of how whole how long to hold those passive splits? Yeah, for sure. So I definitely agree with everything Dr. George said. And I think that um, this is a situation where the pendulum swung really far in one direction, whereas I think a few bad eggs made it, you know, a big problem. You know, I think there's the majority of coaches understand the limits of motion and are 
openly communicating and are not doing things that are dangerous. Um, I think there's been a few people who maybe took that to the extreme and it became a problem. So I think the research reflects this. I think the medical uh, world reflects this, that consistency is more important than intensity. I think that's where people run off the, tr the rails here. And so they'll see an athlete who has a, a limited split or a limited shoulder motion and they'll, they'll instantly jump to a shoulder stretch or a split and they'll just be a little bit too aggressive versus maybe thinking with their critical thinking hat on and taking a step back and realizing there's a lot of reasons why somebody doesn't have motion as Dr. George alluded to. So I think that really the most important thing people have to have in their mind is, is education around what can limit those things. And a perfect example that you mentioned is somebody's arms don't go overhead and they say, well, your shoulders are tight. And so they stretch their shoulders. They miss the boat because it's a thoracic spine limitation. And I think there's many instances that we see where um, you couldn't be able to get your arms overhead because your shoulders, the soft tissue, your lats and your teres major are stiff. Your thoracic spine is stiff. Maybe you're not as strong in your upper back as you should be. So you can't hold that position. Maybe you lack active flexibility. And in some cases, I've seen athletes who have a really funky looking handstand because their wrists are extremely stiff and it looks like they have a shoulder angle, but it's because nobody's ever screened their wrists before. So there's many reasons. Um, and I think we have to really have a, a thought process behind why first and, and really know what we're doing. But to your point about oversplits is there's nothing inherently wrong with oversplits, but they must be earned like everything else. I think that the problem is, again, we have poor Sally who's not, you know, picked the wrong parents and she's in the same line as, you know, <laughs> 400, you know, 400 kids that have great splits. And so she's put on a panel map because everybody else is doing it. Well, that's not appropriate. She hasn't really earned the right to do that safely because she's not there passively on her regular split, nor is she, you know, maybe probably appropriate to know what's a good versus a bad stretch. And so there was a big systematic review that came out um, by uh, two researchers that was really good. It summarized a lot of flexibility articles and it said that uh, static stretching works, you know, PNF stretching works, ballistic stretching is a little bit on the dicier side, but it works. It increases range of motion. They all work if you do it with a good screen and you consistently do it for the right reasons. So I think that everyone always takes a lot of argument about what's the best stretch. And I think you should be looking for the best set of principles for why you should cert choose certain exercises and not, you know, for that. And two sets of 30 seconds for those static holds did increase range of motion. Um, but I think we also need to look at things like eccentrics. Those are really good support behind them for desensitizing things. And also look at a lot of other strength conditioning things to help kind of get a good balance around the joint. So long answer, I'm sorry, but it, it kind of, I want to dig into that a little bit. Dr. Hey, um, anyone else wants to comment? Chime in. Are we Dr. good? George, oh, Tony, please. Go to Dr. George first. He's smarter oh, okay. than me. <laughs> well, I'm not smarter than Tony. <laughs> Secondly, let's get on the record that he knows far more gymnastics than I'll ever know. Uh, in flexibility, in flexibility, there's also what's called uh, structural limitations versus functional limitations. Some people structurally are never going to do over splits. Uh, the, the, the way the head of the femur is received into the cup-like acetabulum is so deeply received, they're never going to be able to do even a, a regular split, regardless of the amount of training or the type or the kind or the intensity. So you have to, you have to, it's a judgment call on the part of coaches, but you have to sort of screen people carefully and understand that certain people, no matter what they do, will never be as flexible as other people who oftentimes do less. That's just how we're put together. We're put together differently. Just like I will not be playing in the NBA anytime soon. <laughs> 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 Tony? Okay. Um, I, I have a limited amount of time in the gym that, that, uh, that I can use. Um, so really, since... After the 96, when we got rid of compulsories in 96, I can say I honestly have not touched a kid in flexibility unless I was squaring a hip or correcting a body shape. I had that revelation that what's the point of having an oversplit if a judge stops looking at it at 180 degrees, how much work am I putting in to getting that next 10 or 15 degrees when it really isn't having an overall effect on my score? So I, my whole philosophy kind of changed to that I'm worried more about movements than muscles and, and flexibility. If I look at somebody and they can jump and do a 180 degree straddle split, I'm really fine. And we're going to stretch down at the end of workout more because 
we've worked hard and I just want to kind of give these muscles time to relax and to work through, you know, and, and to work through what all this work that we've done. I am, I've had some huge Tkachevs out of kids who had very limited shoulder and back. I've had some huge tumblers out of kids who really struggled to hit splits. Okay? So I look and go, this is how this kid is made. I'm not going to enter, uh, I'm not going to race a Fiat against a Ferrari. But if I have a Ferrari, I'm going to clean the windshield. I'm not going to change the brakes. I'm just going to let it go. <laughs> Sherry, did you want to say something? No, I think you guys have covered it. It's awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. All right, Pat. Okay, so we have a question here from the chat from uh, Craig. He said, could you please ask the panelists whether or not they would conditioning test the athletes upon the return to see where they're physically at in order to determine what steps need to be taken moving forward? Tony? I, I, I believe it's important that you do not do that for about the first two weeks. Just let the kids get back in and get, and get comfortable. If you come back in and, and you test them right away, it, it, it's too, too much emotional stress. You're going to put too much pressure on them to, to show what they've been doing in this really unprecedented time. Just let them relax in two weeks, get a feeling of it. And if you feel you need to do a test because then you want to personalize the workouts more, then do it. But I, I, I would not even go there for two weeks. Like we're just going to, we're just going to bounce and have fun. And Oh God, no, I'm not going to test anybody until two weeks after at least. Dave. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with that. I've had a lot of emails from a variety of organizations and places that are asking me what the best set of monitoring and return to sport power tests are should we do plyo push-ups and counter seat jumps and what are we doing and are we doing sprint tests and i'm like you shouldn't be doing anything because one you're going to ruin the athletes mentally and emotionally being like i'm not i'm not caught up and whatever but also too is like it's completely invalid the data is completely invalid and if you haven't had a baseline before this what are you comparing it to you're just making someone feel bad because <laughs> of course they're going to be worse you know we're all going to be worse you know we're going to be bad spotters probably when we in eight years when we can spot again after the vaccine comes out right like don't judge yourself on it but like the kids need time to just like tony said just get back to liking the sport and be with their friends and get the rust out and just let it go man like in, in a month from now if you sit down and like tony said a couple of kids are really struggling in certain areas then maybe you can put in some stuff that's like as part of it but i would that's like so far down on my list of importance Totally agree. Uh, anyone else want to chime in or should we uh, move on? Anyone? We good? Move on. Okay, yep. great, great. So I'm going to go into the, uh, the next category uh, besides after flexibility is uh, strength. Now, uh, there are some questions once again about strength. Uh, some of the topics of strength development is, you know, is it just body weight strength or do we actually use weights? Uh, another thing is, do we want to condition strength until the point of depletion where the athlete is totally fatigued or should we just do it in the gradual increments or set numbers? And then last of all, the big question, when is the best time to condition? Beginning of practice, end of practice, during events, during rotations. Obviously, you don't want to do fatigue conditioning while you're doing events, but those are some of the big questions. I'd like to start with Dr. George first. Okay, I'll just unmute you. All yours. Okay, uh, you know, my, my recommendation would be that power training, strength training, be done at the end of, uh, of skill learning and routines and that type of thing. And secondly, uh, you know, to me, it's not strength training per se. That's a story half told. It's power training. Power training is a rate at which you can perform an activity. And that's what gymnastics is about. It's the quickness with which you can move body parts. So to me, power training uh, is, the, is the key type of training uh, as opposed to simply strength training. And secondly, I would recommend that, that most, if not all power training be done by skill simulation with the performer and not with weights. 
Uh, I've been involved in the weight training industry as a designer of weight products for 25 years. I'm intimately familiar with weight, weight training. And while it may have some broad applications here and there, by and large, a gymnast is moving his or her own body uh, against gravity through various controls. And that's how the training should be. It, for my money, that's what I would say. Dave, can you follow up on that? Sure, yeah, I definitely agree that all of us are in the game of trying to get explosive body weight power as our end goal. You know, that's what we're all trying to get our, our kind of funneling our strength adaptations towards all the way on the road. That's like periodization 101, right? Um, my personal opinion is that I think that because on the medical side, uh, the forces are astronomical on some of the kids uh, in terms of, you know, 18 to 23 times body weight we sometimes see. I feel in the strength portion, a small piece of it can definitely have um, weight training involved if it's safely done. But I think that the far majority of your time should be based on basic calisthenics and gymnastics shaping and stuff like that. I think in the off season is typically when we put that in. So when we work with college programs, we advise that maybe one day per week, they add some of that in or two days per week. And then we usually have maybe two months of that, two and a half months. Uh, and then mostly as we funnel our way into the preseason, we're pretty much spending most of our time on the gymnastics specific stuff, the power stuff, the more, you know, routine construction, things of that nature. And so, and the only reason that I, um, try to add some of that in is just because of the, the forces being so high. So I think there is value in, in loading up a, a small amount of weight for younger athletes that are learning how to control themselves under high loads. Um, just because I think the, the force divide is if we don't add some sort of muscular capacity to buffer those things with basic movement patterns, I think the joints take the brunt of it. So uh, that's my personal opinion, but uh, I, I definitely think, again, this is a situation where the pendulum swung too far is, you know, people saw gymnasts starting to lift, especially in like college and stuff. And they were like, Oh, we have to do all of that. And then they completely forgot about how 50, if not 75% of your time should probably be spent on just basic swings and basic shaping and, you know, all that stuff. But, you know, uh, doing some goblet squats and doing some single leg RDLs and stuff to balance out the body is, is definitely um, valuable, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Sherry, how about with the uh, Masters of Sports programs? How much do you see in, like, strength training and your focus on that? Um, that's been a, a big uh, program for Mary and I to try to develop. Um, and that's probably been the biggest question that people have is, you know, when do we do it? How much time during the training? If it's a four hour, do we spend one hour? You know, and, and sometimes I think they get confused with the season that they're in. You know, they're wanting to do the same amount of conditioning, you know, in the middle of their season or toward the end as they do in the summer. So it's that, that to me is still a confusion. Uh, but I want to quickly ask the panel um, to address the ankle weight issue that's still out there. It's I do or they, don't. Yeah. Anyone want to jump on that? I will not lie. I, I trained as an athlete with ankle weights. I, I use them for forever. And in the beginning, I did use ankle weights with my athletes when I was a younger coach. And then gradually, I moved away from it. Uh, don't get mad at me. I was very young. But I used to have them do full bar routines. Come on, we all did it. I know, I know. Yeah, but we now, all I've, did. now I've kind of moved away to very simple, very static stuff. But love to hear the science behind it. Dr. George, why don't you lead us off? Well, <laughs> ankle weight. We all, we all did lots of things, you know, to try to improve our training. But but my feeling, my, my findings ultimately have been this. If you want to increase your loads, increase your rates. In other words, rate training is the, to me is the key as it relates to gymnastics. We have to keep coming back to what is the criteria for the type of training we do. So you have to constantly keep looking at what are the demands of gymnastics. The demands of gymnastics to me, well, you can, you can do some weight training. I'm, I'm not saying that, but the demands of gymnastics have nothing to do with weights. It has to do with moving my body and how quickly I can move my body. You know, I could still do a glide kip if only I could get my feet to the bar in time. <laughs> At my age, I could do it. I know what it feels like. If only I could get my feet there in time. In other words, it has to do with the quickness with which I can move my body. And the quicker I try to move my body, the greater the load. And if I try to accelerate that, not just be quick, but accelerate it more and more and more, the load 
goes up correspondingly. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I am the weight. <laughs> Very good point. Dave, do you mind uh, adding to that? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think everybody kind of agrees that we all, we've all had ideas that were intentions were good, but execution didn't come out exactly the way we wanted it to. And so, um, yeah, when I was a younger coach, I used him a ton as a gymnast and my coach had me use him. And, you know, we would do pommel horse routines, full routines, we would do whatever, you know, and um, dip cuts on P-bars and stuff. And I think as, as the science evolved, um, there's a, a very large body of science in the hip micro instability world, which is, you know, not worth getting into, but essentially saying that because of the joint laxity that gymnasts have, you know, plus the extreme ranges of motion, um, that if we add more weight to the end of the limb and do very aggressive, you know, ballistic movements, that the force is exponentially higher on the joint itself. And so I think for the things that we wanted to use them for, which is like active flexibility and kind of doing resisted training, I think the science has supported that. It puts a lot of stress on the hip joint, the labrum, um, some of the capsular tissue. And I've, I've unfortunately treated a lot of gymnasts with labral tears, um, not because of an ankle weight, but it was part of the program. And it was one of the first things that we pulled away um, after they got back to training. And so I think that that's the science behind why it's concerning. Now, that being said, there are definitely a few roles that it still plays a great amount of uh, important sport. If you have an advanced athlete doing slower, like core training and doing some things of that nature or some more shaping and stuff, it's completely fine because it's not ballistic and it's more of a static movement. It's not like you're actively kicking your leg exponentially faster. And so I think it's, again, it's about understanding the science of it, but then also understanding what the intention is and what you're trying to do. Uh, I think that therabands are a great option for people that are trying to do something like that. When you have an advanced athlete who shows they're ready to go to something, you know, there's certainly many other ways to get about the power and the rate, like Dr. George said, um, without maybe putting, it's just a cost to benefit ratio. It's the risk of something happening. Yep. I, I definitely agree with you. Lots of times we don't realize, you know, like the old adage, it takes years to train an athlete and basically only seconds to ruin it all through an injury, a careless one too. Uh, Tony, did you want to input anything? Please. Um, simplifying it for me, and it actually goes back to something I learned from Jerry um, I think the first time I saw him speak was maybe 1984, 1985. Um, but what's your goal? What do you want? Um, I think in the example he was giving, he was talking about rope climb. And if you want to climb the rope faster, climb the rope 10 times. Try to climb it faster each time. Climbing it with weight makes you better at climbing it with weight. What do I want my athletes to do? I want to try to replicate that as best I can. So I, I, um, I, I really concentrate on uh, conditioning movements, not I don't look at it as particular muscle groups. Um, when I condition during the dur like like during practice, I'm not conditioning their arms while they're on bars. I'm giving them some leg exercises to do while they're on bars. So I'm not exhausting a muscle that I need. But these are just their side stations because otherwise we know they just stand at the chalk bucket and talk. Um, yeah, so, so those are some things that I do. But I only use weights if I can't replicate the action um, easily. And for instance, for cast handstands, um, I mean, how we need cast handstands. How many cast handstands can we do in a practice? So I'm doing things with bungee cords. I'm doing things with small weights. But that's more just because I can't replicate that action in any other way. But I, I look and go, my end goal is here. And I'm going to do everything I need to get to there. And very little times does it require me using an additional weight to get to there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, so the next topic I'm going to look into is basically the speed aspect. You know, we looked at flexibility, strength, speed, explosivity, uh, how to get our, our athletes faster. You know, the old uh, saying between fast twitch and slow twitch, how we perceive that if we have different types of athletes. And also the, the world of plyometrics, you know, it, good, bad, lots of it, little it, in the beginning, later, how much, you know, how do we develop it? So uh, Dr. George, if you can express some comments on that. Wow, that's a, a lot of topics to... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, you can break it up. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, essentially, uh, you see, power, power is speed. It's the rate at which you do work. That's why I said that power training, even if you start with very light loads and easy types of exercises where you 
go through the exercise with the correct form, and then you see if you can do uh, a series of repetitions, and then you see if you can do explosive rate against the resistance. And then you change the position of the body relative to gravity, and you go through that same paradigm again, and again for something even harder. Uh, that's all has to do with training for rate or for speed, okay? I uh, see. I do. I, 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 in my text, I talk about flexibility training and power training because strength training is a part of power, and power is rate, is rate training, okay? For example, if you, if you bring your feet, as an example, uh, hanging from, from, the, uh, from the bars, and bring your feet to the bars and bring it back down, up and back down, up and back down. Okay, the quickness with which a person can go pull back down, whoop back down, boom back down. Okay, that's ray training. It's also full range of motion training. It's also using the muscles most involved for that flexibility training. And it's also skill simulation. So you see, to me, that type of thing, and it, it, it also uses the body and the quickness with which you move increases the load on your body. If I'm slower, the load is less than if I'm quicker. So to me, that type of training uh, is the, uh, uh, to me, the most beneficial for people in gymnastics. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dave, uh, in addition to that, do you want to talk a little bit about plyometrics and whether you do that in your training? Yeah, for sure. So definitely do it. Uh, I think kind of as a common theme, as everything we've talked about here, is it really all comes down to being educated about what's the goal here? You know, what's the goal and how do I get there? Um, I think that plyometrics and power training are certainly incredibly important and we need it in gymnastics. I think the problem comes up is when people don't understand maybe the science or the physiology behind some of these things and they overdose them, not on malintention, just because they don't understand it, right? Think about classic, you know, panel mat lines. There's kids doing 500, 600,000 ground contacts in a 20 minute circuit that someone's doing for cardio and they're saying it's plyos, right? Well, Plyometric training by nature has a, a stretch shortening cycle and you're trying to express as fast as you can rate of force development. You're trying to go quick. So when you're trying to do power training or do really explosive plyometrics, um, you have to really consider the fact that most other sports and most of the science supports like doing a, a lower number of repetitions with incredibly high effort and then allowing the athlete to recover a little bit or go do another body part and then come back and do it again because the goal is is fast twitch so if you're just tiring the athlete out and they're doing you know moderate effort because they're getting so pooped well you're losing a rate coding you're losing the motor units to work fast that's what you want and so i think as long as you're designing power and you're designing training like jerry said with that explosive up that's what you want. And as long as the intention is there and you, and you really understand your planning for that, I think it's great. And so we use plyometrics and I'm actually, I used to not do as much in the off season because I was worried about grind contacts, but I'm starting to do more because of some of the science related to Achilles tendon conditioning and some of the studies we're working on on Achilles tear. So I'm starting to do a little bit more, but at a time that's appropriate during this um, session when it's not just, let's go do 500 box jumps and their form is terrible and they're not quick at all. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Tony or Sherry, did you want to chime in on anything? Or yes, Tony, please. Um, it, it, as far as individual, like, like doing plyometrics by itself, uh, I always just again try to make it gymnastics related. Um, so I'm not going to do a lot of box jumps, but we're going to do five sets of five back handsprings, four sets of five front handspring. <laughs> You know, so so they're they're replicating that gymnastics exercise. Very young, I, I think I realized that there needs to be a time element in all your conditioning because it's not a matter of doing um, ten leg lifts. It's a matter of how many leg lifts can you do in ten seconds. So I've always tried to add that time element because it is something measurable and it's something that the kids can can go oh my god i did 11 in 10 seconds so they have that little bit of motivation but it's also a more for me i'm going to say it's a more usable uh strength element yep. thank you thank you um so the next topic i want to really look into is sometimes you know what we're told our gymnasts, you know, aerobic versus, you know, anaerobic, uh, whether or not 
distance running, cardio running, you know, cardio type workouts are good for gymnasts? Or should we try to stay away from those things like to build endurance for floor, especially? Do you guys have any opinions on that subject at all? No. Uh, Dave? <laughs> uh, I do. Um, I used to do when I was younger and when I was studying in school, it was only bursted, only aerob anaerobic um, capacity work, only short routine work. Um, and I think that as I, you know, early in your career, you realize how much you don't know. And I spent some time around some really, really um, intelligent uh, energy systems coach who work on the world and the elite level. And I think I saw value in adding a little bit of mixed training for athletes again, based on the right time and season and based on what your goal is. Right. And I think we kind of alluded this way in the beginning is practices are four hours and they're long. And so I think that there is a role in the off season to use general circuit training for, you know, 15, 20 minutes to try to work some of that longer aerobic capacity, because as strength is funneled into power an aerobic base is funneled into repeat sprints ability into, um, you know, what you can do in 90 seconds. So, so a lot of your capacity to survive a floor routine comes from direct floor training, right? Direct 90 second window training. But when you're dying on the end of the routine and you have to go to your next event in between events, you're not dying from floor to your next event is your aerobic system recovering and clearing out acidity and stuff. So uh, again, it comes down to, it's a piece of it. I think in the summer we add in some of it here and there, but as soon as the summer training is over, we're focusing on putting us up more into the general uh, bursted type training. I think the, the main problem that I see is that people maybe just don't understand how to program for intervals. They don't really understand how the PCR system and the anaerobic system requires more rest time between. So it looks like the kids are not doing anything, but they're actually working that system really hard. So you have to do a little bit of education into, okay, if I really want to train 90 seconds, I'm going to really be working hard and recover. You have to understand I guess some of the science behind that versus what makes a bunch of kids really tired and sweaty for 20 minutes because you want to make them look like they're working hard, which is a mistake that I made. I was like, keep going. You're not working hard enough. Realizing I'm thwarting the adaptation I'm looking for. <laughs> Dr. George, any comments, please? I think he's, he said it uh, quite well. We have to distinguish between in, in, in gymnastics between cardiovascular endurance, which is very important and muscular endurance, which transcends cardiovascular endurance as it relates to gymnastics. In other words, while you need uh, a lot of both, the key component, the great separator, the difference between the champion and the would-be champion is often found in muscular endurance. And muscular endurance, simply put, is the ability to perform uh, a repetitive activity with a fairly heavy workload as compared to simply jogging around a track. My, my son was a, was a distance runner and that had great cardiovascular endurance. Muscular endurance? No, not that much. All right, so muscular, while they're related, our training should be, should focus on muscular endurance because that's the great separate to me. Very good points. Uh, Tony and Sherry, do you want to chime in before you move on or? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I do have a question on the, some of the states are going to be coming online quicker to start their compulsory season. Like Texas, you normally starts the third week in August. Now, how are these coaches going to be able to assess their athletes that they're ready to compete? I mean, I think that it's, it's just such a short time frame, and should we, you know, encourage these coaches to start later? And there's, you know, just don't forego the first few meets to get these kids kind of back into a normal shape so they're safe. Well, yes, Dr. George, I'm not a coach. I used to be a coach a long time ago. I hear Tony thoughts. <clears throat> even. Even, even 15 years before Tony. Yeah. Um, you know, when you go back to compete, is it necessary to max out your routines? Can't you simply go to a competition as a learning and a growing experience, move the routines down to a level that the coach and the gymnast know that are reasonably safe under the circumstances and gain that experience? It's not essential to kill the opponent at every, at every turn, to be in maximum <laughs> performance shape every time. I mean, that's just, that's just, I guess that's a philosophical opinion more than a, 
an academic one, if you would. Yeah. Dave, Tony, any input? I'll let Tony weigh in. I completely agree with Dr. George. I think that people should really be rig pedaling as much more. I think there's one part of me that says one in a hundred years comes a pandemic and you should throw all your planes out the window because we still have no idea when <laughs> we're going to get back. And I mean, if you're planning a meat season right now, I think you're going to be <laughs> sadly disappointed when some things change in the next few months. So agreed. Um, when we get back there, it's going to be unprecedented times. And it goes back to the question. I don't remember where it was, but like, are you going to test your athletes? Like, man, you got to, if you're thinking about testing and when your next meet is, you need to have some serious soul searching and have a couple more days to figure out <laughs> what, what am I doing with kids coaching and why am I here and what's happening? And is, uh, trust me, I work with very highly competitive people who have very big aspirations and it's still not the thing we're talking about right now. So I, I, I think Tony's going to probably nail this one on the head. Tony, please unmute yourself. All right. Uh, there you go. You're good. Am I good? Okay. So when, if we were talking optional level gymnastics, when we go to our first competition, you know, mid December, if, if my level nines don't fall twice, I realize I probably didn't work hard enough skills for the rest of the year. You know, so, so we, we want to be falling twice in December, once in January, be a little inconsistent in February, and then putting it together in March when we get to that championship part of the season. With my compulsory kids, oh my God, I'm not even worried. The hardest thing they're going to do, hey, you only fell twice on that beam routine. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's go get an ice cream. Okay, Pat, I think we have another question. Yeah, we had a question in the chat. Um, since we covered the team stuff a lot, um, do we have anything more specific um, for bringing recreational athletes back? what to start with in order to not get them discouraged and also not get them hurt it, since it's hard enough to get enough time for everything when some of them are just training for 30 to 45 minutes a week. Okay. Dave, okay, please of, jump in. Lots of games. <laughs> That's what we're teaching our staff. Games and fun and enjoy the gym. Don't jump in the foam pit probably, unfortunately, because <laughs> it's not clean, but uh, <laughs> yeah, get the parents involved, man. Like have fun. Like, social events like whatever you can do it's safer than the guidelines but trying to get them to be more on the as good coaches especially in the rec level will program circuits that are basic in nature but are still fun and that's the that's why rec coaches are amazing because i don't really see that lens anymore but i think that you have to again plan now for what you're going to do with those kids for 45 minutes when some of the real fun stuff quote unquote is off off the mark very true very true we only yeah. have like a uh, five minutes left so uh, we'll go a little quicker uh, dr george do you want to or tony Anyone? We good? Okay, good. All right. Sherry, Sherry, did you want to say something? Okay. So another hey. question, another question no, I want I'm to good. Ask, Thank you. ask the panel is um, about impact. Uh, I, I know in the past, some uh, coaches have uh, said that you basically need to toughen your athlete, you know, ossification, uh, building the bone density, teaching them to impact. So they would do a lot of repetition on hard landing, you know, vaults on hard mats. But then a lot of coaches started to move away from that, you know, more soft landing, soft landing. But then there's the argument, well, if you do too much soft landing, how do you prepare your athletes for the harder impact or for the double flips or for the more advanced thing? Uh, what is your opinion on that kind of train of thought? Dr. George, could you go first? Well, landing is landing, whether it's hard or soft. You can, you can describe it as a hard landing or a soft landing, but a person who understands how to re to look for the ground on landing, how to reach with their feet, to try to get their feet, if you would, to the ground before their body actually arrives, and to give in sufficiently on the landing, will serve to dissipate the force through that distance in a relatively equal fashion. And that's what should be trained, whether it's soft landing or hard landing. Soft landing and hard landing is just the result of the kinds and types of skills we do. Proper landing technique, though, is the same for both. And that's look for the ground, reach with your feet, try to get your feet there before the rest of your body, give in in a progressive fashion sufficiently in your ankles, knees, and hips. And you need to have reasonable uh, muscular strength and power in, in your legs, particularly in your lower body, to 
sustain the impact. Most kids on landing, even, even the best, to uh, land in a fashion that is uh, not very healthy because they tend to punch the mat when they land. And the mat, as Shakespeare once says, returns to play the inventor and causes them to hop. Okay, <laughs> so that happens all the time, even in the international competitions. They haven't learned how to land correctly. And that's why basic training, basic landing technique is the same. It has, it has uh, no conscience, only memory. If you do it correct, it pays you back. If you do it incorrect, it also pays you a dividend in the opposite way. A very good point. Uh, Dave, if yeah. I, if I, oh, Tony, let's go to Tony real quick. I'm just, uh, again, being the guy that, that's in the gym, I think every kid is going to be different and need different, you know, need a different amount of landings to be comfortable. Um, you, you have the difference of spatial awareness versus impact awareness. Kids are going to be afraid of what they don't know or what they don't understand. If they take their first uh, Sukahara vault and they've only ever landed into a soft landing mat, that first time on a hard landing mat ha is a little terrifying. So you have to replicate that so they understand what they're going, what they're going into. We spend a lot of time on working good landing technique and, and spatial awareness so they can pull it together into that impact awareness. I want them to go from the uncomfortable, the flip, to the comfortable, the landing. I've been here before. I know what this feels like. I, and so, so they're comfortable with that. That's the ideal. But in the end, every kid is going to be different. Danny's going to be able to do it in two turns. And Sherry's it's going to take her 10 turns. To, to figure it out. Um, there's no substitute to knowing the athletes you're working with, to know your medium. Thank you. Dave? Yeah, I completely agree with what they both said. Those are fantastic points. And for me, I think just expanding on, you know, adding to is I think it really comes down to dosage and it comes down to planning. And I think this is really the biggest thing. And so we always make the running joke in the clinic that, you know, Tylenol is good for your headache, but not if you take zero or if you take 40. You know, there's problems on both ends of those two things. And I think this is the same situation with a lot of things we're talking about is, like Tony was saying, is you have to kind of do enough that they feel comfortable with, but not give them 40 Tylenol. You know, or, but you have to expose them, one, from a, a biological point of view to, to get them safe and ready for it, but then also from a mental point of view. So I think the second piece to it is planning, right? If you don't have a plan for... You know, planning comes down to the micro, which is what are you going to do in one season? When are you going to start transitioning? You know, when's the cutoff date for someone who says, if you're going to flip at this meet on hard, how many weeks back out do you have to be safely flipping without a spot comfortably for us to allow you to do that in a meet? If you don't have a general guideline or a game plan for that, you're going to get to the end of the road and you're going to kind of panic a little bit. You know what I mean? So I think there's the, the yearly plan, but then there's the, the macro plan too, for sure is, uh, you know, should a 12 year old be doing tons and tons of volumes on hard when their goal is to make it to college when they're 18, you know, I think that comes down to a, a little bit of an ego check and making sure you have a long-term plan in nature. It's certainly safe and to compete it, but you know, doing 50 just to do 50 is maybe, you know, not the, the strongest idea when they have 10 more years of gymnastics in them possibly. So yeah, dosage and planning is really all I would like to add to that. Thank you again. So once again, those were all wonderful questions. I really want to thank all our panelists for being here and everything. Uh, if any of you guys want to say any final words, uh, uh, please do so. Uh, I have to go watch Secret Life of Pets 2 with my whole No story. problem, Dave. And, and everyone tomorrow, Dave is uh, <laughs> hosting something really awesome. Uh, so we, we want to be there for Saturday, right, Dave? Yeah, come on down and uh, enjoy. It's got a fun lineup. Got a big, yes. old, big old day of people. Yeah. Uh, um, Dr. Thank George. You, thank you. Sherry, Sherry, once again, I want to thank Sherry. Of course, check out her Masters of Sport. Tony Retrosi, yeah. Jim Momentum. Tony, do you want to say any final words or Dr. George real quick? Uh, if, if I could oh. speak. All um, right, Tony first, and then we'll have Dr. George finish us. Uh, th this has been fantastic. Um, worldwide, I'm impressed by gymnastics coaches that are doing everything they can in this odd downtime to learn. And so I really appreciate people like, like John, like Patrick, that have taken the time to put something together to do this. Um, so thank you very much for doing this. And I'm drinking bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. George, some final words, please. 
Well, I just will, will, will quote uh, my favorite coach of, of them all. Uh, some of you may have heard of this coach. His name was, was Michelangelo. And he said, I saw an angel in the marble and I carved and I carved until I set her free. And that's our job as coaches. That was a beautiful, a very fitting end. I feel inspired. Awesome. So once again, I wish to thank the entire panel. I wish to thank everyone for joining us uh, to our program, Coaches on Couches. Please join us for episode four next week. We're going to have some wonderful people again. And uh, please be safe, uh, be well, and all my best to everyone. Thank you again. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, I did it. Fine. So this was episode three of Coaches on Couches, the brains of gymnastics. We were discussing biomechanics and the building the gymnast body. Uh, once again, our panel was Dr. Gerald George, Professor Emeritus from Department of Kinesiology, University of Louisiana. Dr. Dave Tilley from Shift Movement Science and Gymnastics Education. And he'll be hosting a very wonderful program tomorrow, all day. Sherry Hoffman from Masters of Sports, the Digital Education for Gymnastics Coaches. And Tony Retrosi from Gym Momentum, Atlantic Gymnastics, and also our own Yuseka chairman. My name is John Min. I'm also the Yuseka video chairman from Region 7. And we have our co-host, Pat Goldsmith from Region 6, New York Gymnastics. Uh, once again, thank you so much. And join us next week for episode four, Power Developing and Maintaining Vault and Tumbling. We have a, a great panel. We have Dan Baker, Tony Gaiman, Bill Roth, and Chuck Krause. So once again, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing everyone.